and welcome along to the Property Academy podcast. I'm your host, Emma Knight. And I'm Andrew Nichol. And today on the show, there were well, you yeah, were so sorry, angry. Sorry, I'm I, Andrew Nichol. I'm sorry, I was busy doing two things at once. No, we're going to leave that in now. Oh, People right. need to know who you really are. Well, normally the comment is that I'm not paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> well, today on the show, we're once again joined by property investor Ilsa Wolf. We're talking about saving your existing portfolio. So again, with these government tax changes, some property investors worry they're not going to be able to hold on to those properties. So how can you increase the rent you're able to achieve so you're able to pay that tax and continue holding those properties? Now, we've got a bit of a different situation to the last person we talked about. So in the last episode, we talked about a whole hog renovation. This one's a bit different. Also, walk us through the details of what's different here. Yes, we've just started working with a new investor that I'm particularly excited about. She's just signed up um, and has a very interesting portfolio. So quite different from Sharon that we just spoke about on the previous episode. Um, this new investor has a, a great portfolio um, around the greater Auckland area that she has been building up since 2009. She's done um, really and- well. She's just a, just a youngish girl. Uh, and, and How young? Course, oh, I can't remember off the top of my head. Is what, what, uh, I, I think she's 30 ish. I thought it was 36. Oh, you, you, you actually, I think she is my age. Young. (laughs) (laughs) Really interesting how um, this new investor did start her property investment journey. She was in her second or third year of university and her flatmate was studying a valuation degree. And in 2009, he said to her, hey, there are so many deals out there jump out and buy something. So she did. She started in 2009. And because of that, now with a a wider Auckland portfolio of five properties, she has built up some serious equity, which is really fantastic. A number of um, large sites. And now with the Auckland Unitary Plan, posed so many opportunities, both from um, a renovation perspective, but also having that second round of future land development. She's going to be retired very young. And actually, let's talk about that, because my understanding is that she wanted to replace her income. Yes. So she is in the medical profession, working full time, um, has a very good salary, uh, but at the same time, her passion is art and she would like to open a gallery. Um, Now, she has this portfolio of five properties that I've mentioned. She has never renovated or touched them. She has always settled the property as is, rented it out and never looked back. So she has these five properties that now fast forward to 2021, um, some serious deferred maintenance on a couple of them and just some in original condition that are massively under- uh, under-optimised, I would say. And back in the good old days of a few months ago, when you could just buy a property and rent it out, that was just fine. Uh, and, and they would have just ticked along and, and done their thing. But of course, now with, with the tax changes, um, there was going to be some significant tax liability uh, when the full interest tax deductibility had been taken away in four years' time. And um, if, if we were going to get this investor to a position where she could rely on some of that rental income um, to supplement her income or, or reducing of hours and stuff like that, then then paying a whole lot of tax wasn't going to get her there. Well, just yeah. walk me through in that case, Ilsa. What, were the, what was the cash flow before the government changes? And once introduced fully, what would we expect that portfolio to be at? So the portfolio, I ran some numbers, some initial analysis on it, which she hadn't done before and found that her existing portfolio as is generates roughly a forty five to $50,000 passive income. And I asked her, do you feel like you're receiving those dollars in the bank? She said, no. She said that a couple of the properties have somehow have terrible luck. She has one property in New Lynn that seems to be hit by lightning, trees fall over, all sorts of Actually random Actually hit by lightning? Yeah. We should rent it for you, Ed. <laughs> <laughs> The the poor thing, every odd month she seems to have a maintenance bill on this particular property. So she said, no, even though it looks on paper that she's making 50,000, let alone the government tax changes that she's now going to be hit by in the next four years, she does not feel that she's actually taking that income. And, uh, you know, that's a direct result of not upgrading the properties she's had for such time. There's a lot of ongoing maintenance and it's time that we actually do upgrade some of these places. So we'll be through then in that case. What was, we've talked about the cash flow. We thought it was kind of 45, 50. 55k didn't really feel like we were getting that through after the government changes coming in come in what did you what was the impact on cash flow you anticipated how much worse was it going to be 
Because these properties were purchased over the last 11 years, the most recent being last month within the new tax regulation, um, the once we ran the numbers, we found that that profit of $45,000 to $50,000 actually dropped to $30,000 per annum once those tax changes take full effect. So about 15, 20K less, that's probably what we'd expect, uh, yes. given that some of those properties that she bought early on would have quite low mortgages compared to that rent. But then if you're, if you're kind of not feeling like you're getting that 50k in the bank because of that money that was going out for maintenance and all of a sudden you've got 20k going out to tax, that 30 quickly becomes zero really or negative really exactly. quickly. 100%. The big revelation off the back of the numbers was that she had no idea because of that how close she could be um, yes. by putting some of the strategies in place. She didn't realise how quickly she would be able to replace her salary with passive income. So what was really what is really great within her portfolio, she has five Auckland properties, three of them are standalone houses, and we'll go into some further analysis around the um, Auckland Unitary Plan as to what future developable opportunities there are within those. But the other two, one is a really large uh, six, uh, sorry, five bedroom, two bathroom property in Minico, and the other one is a home and income in New Lynn. So um, really big opportunities there. Now, let me ask you then in that case, Ilsa, what was your process for figuring out what you could improve to get that cash flow up? Yeah, so knowing that her number one priority is to replace her nursing income in order to be able to go with her own personal passion, what we did was look through the entire portfolio, assess her current rents compared to what those potential market rents should be in their existing condition. Then we looked at all of the floor plans to work out, okay, can how we, as we work through the cash flow hacking principles with those six principles, what um, sizable uplift could be redeemed from each of those properties. And then we ranked them. So from number one to five, from largest uplift opportunity through the cash flow hacking system down to number five. And then as money would allow, uh, she would roll through each of those five projects. And what we've found is that for the numbers one and two, the number one uh, property that she has is a home and income in New Lynn that would uh, massively benefit from uh, using all six principles from the cash flow hacking system. And then number two was this uh, large property in Monaco where demand for rent rental properties is extremely high um, and this would suit a really large family who would be looking for a six bedroom, two bathroom property. For her five properties, once we ran the numbers, um, by only assessing the actual um, the full renovations for the top number one and two and assuming before we actually visit the other three, um, purely by increasing up to market rent on those other three and then running through the renovation program we have for one and two, her um, cash flow position would double. So we were going to generate an additional wow. 55000 passive income for her, which would take that um, income over the next three to four years up to almost one hundred thousand dollars passive, and even when those tax changes take full effect um, in the four or five years time, um, that drops down to roughly seventy k. Wow. Um, yeah, and that seventy k is a post tax income, which is actually right, more than the post tax salary. So we're already awesome. there. And, and sorry, what was you might have said this? What was the cost of completing those the first one and two projects? So the first renovation project, which would be for the home and income in New Lynn, um, there are two options that we're running through. So as a second step, what we want to do is have her review the numbers with you, Andrew, right. um, so that she can work out whether she will go with a lighter version of the cash flow hacking yes. system, simply add that additional bedroom to get the cash flow up significantly, yep. roll on to the next one, or um, is there a way that she should um, dip into some of her revolving cash flow, yes. see what we can do to help her with extra lending, yes. do the full renovation so that she can add even more and, and ideally that would roll her into the next one. So let me ask you this also, what was the cash flow like after you'd done this? So we knew the properties were all up as a portfolio, were up roughly 50, they were going to be up 30 once the government tax changes came in. What, what was it after you'd done, done your cash flow hacking just in be, terms of these individual properties? Just bearing in mind that the the, the forty five fifty was actually not quite that because of deferred maintenance. So we'll call it. Let's 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 say it was it was forty and it was twenty five after the government changes rolled out. On the Newland Home and Income, which we were going to tackle first, uh, what we've projected is that if we go with the lighter version of the renovation, because the investor will be um, in this 
in this option be funding it from some revolving credit plus your own cash flow. Um, the rents would increase on the main home from 475 to 600 per week. So that would be purely by adding uh, the extra fourth bedroom to the main house and some minor cosmetic changes, but the minor dwelling would and would remain the same at 400 per week. So we'd be looking at an uplift from 875 total to around $1,000. That's what we'd project. However, if through the review with Andrew, we find that we can get her some extra lending to facilitate the full renovation on this property, there will be an even further uplift. So on the main house, I would expect to see around a $700 per week um, with a four bedroom conversion wow. and then 450 with the minor dwelling with some improvements there. So we'd be looking at 1100 150 per week compared to the 875 she currently receives. It kind of makes me think also that almost that many investors out there who have acquired properties that are just normal properties that are out there on the market probably have some amount of this that needs to be done. Increasing that rent back to market levels, some amount of improving the property, uh, either cosmetically or adding that extra bedroom in order to increase the cash flow. It seems like there are so many opportunities for that. That's right. I think the majority majority of investors who I've worked with uh, don't have the light bulb moment until we go through that active review process to actually see the numbers of what potentially can be those after after renovation numbers. And they don't realize how much money and how much income they are literally leaving on the table right now. For yeah. one reason or another, they make do with how things go around and don't question how much more they could be optimizing each each property they have. And I think actually that's because investors, um, despite what you read in the paper, aren't that greedy. They're just looking to kind of, you know, break even, make some capital growth in the in the future or, or, or um, cover their costs, make a little bit of money. They're not really thinking about the squeezing every last dollar out of a tenant. But when significant changes come in or interest rates go up and those kind of things, you really need to have done it in advance so that you're not, um, you know, fighting the market at the time uh, because, you know, you might have a tendency locked in at that stage when rates go up. And one thing I'd just pull you up on as well, Andrew, is it's not necessarily about squeezing every last dollar out of the tenant, but squeezing every last dollar out of the property, making that property so valuable that the tenants are willing to yes. pay for it, or you're appealing to a different type of tenant who, sure. who needs those more bedrooms or those that larger number of bedrooms. Bedrooms. Now, let's just before we wrap up, uh, Elsa, walk us through the second property as well. Was it a similar story or a bit different? The Randwick property, Randwick Park property in Minico, um, is similar in terms of numbers. Uh, however, it's a, it's a single large standalone property, a very large dwelling that's five bedroom, two bathroom. Um, I think with some extra due diligence, we may find out whether we could separate the underfloor into a legal um, secondary dwelling. But in lieu of that, if we're working with the exact house as it stands right now, um, we can increase that capacity of that house from a five bedroom, two bathroom to a six bedroom, two bathroom. And we have that opportunity now because the current tenants have given notice. And so this is one of those rare opportunities um, that Andrew just mentioned that it's a catalyst for um, this investor to review what's going on there. It just makes me so happy, Ilsa, because the thing is that tenants basically have to take properties as they are, right? A tenant's not going to pull out paint, do it up, make it look nicer. And the fact that investors are out there doing this, improving the rental stock, adding extra bedrooms so that larger families have options, and we know that we've got more and more of that happening, uh, particularly in Auckland, uh, you know, it's just such a wonderfully socially beneficial thing to do. That's right, yes. And she's taken the tenancy over from the previous vendor and the previous ma uh, property management firm without questioning the current, you know, the status quo. So she's been happy to leave it there as a functioning rental that was looking after itself and the tenants were taking great care of it. But now she has the opportunity to review that. That's what we're doing. And I think one of the big things uh, working through this process um, with Elsa while we, while we uh, kind of develop um, the Accelerate program it, is, it really identifies that um, significant changes, obviously, are coming for, for property investors, um, but you don't want to make a knee-jerk reaction and just sudden, suddenly start selling things off because, you know, you'll always regret that in 20 years' time when you look back and go, God, I can't believe I sold that property for a million dollars. It's worth $3 million now. Um, so if you can find a way to just hold on to your stock, um, then that's a great result. Um, obviously, you don't want to be holding on to a lemon, but if you can turn a lemon into lemonade, 
then. Oh, that's so terrible. <laughs> that's so terrible. <laughs> but there are, like legit, the there are legitimate reasons why you might sell a property, though. You know, if you want to, if it allows you to purchase many more properties and you yes. want to go down that passive strategy, but certainly taking the knee jerk reaction of selling straight away without considering your options is certainly not something that would usually recommend to people uh, jump in the, the deep end and just go ahead with. Fantastic. Let's wrap it up there. But please don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. Really does help us get the message out to more people. People. Thanks for listening to the Property Academy podcast. I'm your host, Ed McKnight. And I'm Andrew Nichols. And we're going to be back again tomorrow with even more daily strategies, tactics, and insights to help you get the most out of the New Zealand property market. Until next time. <laughs> <laughs>